வணக்கம் ஹலோ சோ வெல்கம் டு த நெக்ஸ்ட் வீடியோ ஆன் ஹெரிடேஜ் ஆஃப் தமிழ்ஸ் இன் திஸ் வீடியோ வி வில் கவர் த ஃபிஃப்த் டாபிக் அண்ட் சிக்ஸ்த் டாபிக் செக்யூலர் நேச்சர் ஆஃப் சங்கம் லிட்ரேச்சர் அண்ட் டிஸ்ட்ரிபியூட்டிவ் ஜஸ்டிஸ் பகிர்தல் அறம் சங்கம் லிட்ரேச்சர் திஸ் டாபிக் ஷுட் பி மோர் லைக் அ கொஸ்டின் சோ செக்யூலர் நேச்சர் ஆஃப் சங்கம் லிட்ரேச்சர் வி ஷுட் ஸ்டார்ட் பை த ஸ்டார்ட் வித் த கொஸ்டின் வெதர் சங்கம் லிட்ரேச்சர் இஸ் செக்யூலர் பிஃபோர் தட் வி வில் ஆஸ்க் வாட் இஸ் செக்யூலர் வாட் இஸ் த நீட் டு டேக் சம்திங் எஸ் செக்யூலர் now there are lot of contemporary politics behind this let us not go into that so keep this uh, in an academic point of view we'll look at the definition for the word secular secular is anything not connected with uh, religious or spiritual matters like a secular building a government is secular that makes sense yeah. but uh, where sangam people secular because if you look at sangam poetry there are lot of references to religion uh, to spiritual philosophy spiritual realm and uh, even in day to day life people have believed in various deities they have lot of uh, ritualistic practices so all these were recorded in sangam literature so rather than declaring sangam literature as uh, secular or not secular i will enumerate points for both sides and uh, leave the decision to yourself and of course i am i'm just simply indicating i welcome you recommend that uh, you read the sangam literature yourself and uh, come to a conclusion you know i will provide you points for both sides so are sangam literature secular they are secular in the sense they are one of the oldest non liturgical text so if you look at uh, oldest text in many civilizations in many languages often they are religious text so like in sanskrit we have the vedas smritis they are all having a religious connection the reason they survive is because they are having a religious connection so people very ardently follow them and uh, they preserve those text and uh, they learn the text and they hand over the text to the next generation so they have been preserved because they are religious this that is mostly the case with many other uh, text we have in many of the languages the religious text are available those are the oldest text available because of their religious nature comparing to that sangam literature is basically not a religious text as we discussed in the porul ilakkanam of tamil we see that agam and puram agam ilakkanam and puga pura ilakkanam were there so aga ilakkanam concentrated on the love life of people and pura ilakkanam concentrated on the social life of people especially of uh, important significant people their valor uh, magnanimity like that so basically by definition they are not liturgical they come under what we call uh, heroic age poetry so sangam literature are not liturgical so they are not used for any ritual of course there are parts of sangam literature which are uh, which we can call liturgical or which were directly praising a deity directly having a religious importance like tirumurugattu padai for example tirumurugattu padai is about uh, lord murugan so that is tirumurugattu padai can be treated as a, a religious a liturgical text you can uh, there, there are people who still do what we call parayanam like you know they read the tirumurugattu padai for religious purposes like today people read kandasashti kavasam or uh, tirupugal of arunagiri nadar they also read the tirumurugattu padai for religious purposes for a spiritual connection with lord murugan so there are texts like that there are beautiful paribadal songs from paribadal we have very beautiful songs they are almost like translations of vedas right they are like uh, very similar and uh, in tone and the content they deliver they praise murugan tirumal vishnu kotravai kali they praise madurai city vaigai in a very beautiful way so they are all uh, religious text are available so sangam literature in general they are not directly uh, liturgical text they are not meant for any rituals or sacrifices like that but on the other hand sangam literature they very much talk about deities so we cannot simply bluntly say there is no mention of any gods any deities in sangam literature there are plenty of mentions uh, of deities for example shiva shivan in shiva is uh, mentioned rudra or shiva is mentioned in various ep- uh, epithets so we have like uh, pirava yakai periyon Uh, en tholan en thol bhagavan mukkat piran so all the aspects of shiva like uh, having three eyes nudal vidhi natam so you know having a eye uh, in the forehead so like that and uh, shiva is clearly mentioned as the consort of uma umai parvati so there are mentions of shiva there's a lot of mentions of shiva in purana nuru agana nuru patu patu right so, so often what happens is people will uh, declare that whenever you say there's a mention of a deity especially hindu gods hindu deity what we now identify as hinduism hindu deities people will immediately say okay they are all later additions later interpolations like, but uh, these mentions are spread across all the text of sangam literature so there are definitely mentions of shiva vishnu uh, you know the narperum devam so there there is a occurrence uh, frequent occurrence called the narperum devam four great gods uh, in one mention that four great gods are shiva vishnu balarama and krishna or in other mention they are uh, shiva vishnu indra and uh, balarama or krishna or brahma so there are different combinations but you know people have 
worship them even in Silapadiharam, uh, we see that uh, these mentions are there. Silapadiharam clearly mentions uh, when it describes the Puhar, Pum Buhar, Kaviri Pum Patinam, it clearly mentions the temples for all these deities. So Shiva worship, Vishnu worship, and uh, Muruhan worship, Kvatravai, Kali, that worship, and uh, Balarama worship, Krishna worship, they are all very prevalent in the ancient Tamaragam, even in the Sangam literature. So as far as the data is available, if you take these mentions and conclude, then uh, people have definitely uh, worshipped them and they are all been captured in the Sangam literature. And religious philosophies, I will mention that later. So religious philosophies, uh, Siddhantam, we say, that is also uh, mentioned and captured in Sangam literature. But uh, of course, the Sangam literature, they primarily focus on the Agam Puram themes, I already mentioned that. So, uh, but when you say Agam Puram themes, even for this Agam Puram, the Agam uh, literature, so there are five landscapes, Kurunji, Mullai, Marudam, Neidal, Pali. God is very much part of a landscape. So like uh, we will discuss these in detail in the fourth unit. Anyway, I'll mention here. So when Tolkapiyam uh, classifies, defines the thematic structure for a landscape, what we call Tinai, the one of the important part is also God. So Devam, so the aspects of a land when Tolkapir is enumerating, uh, the first thing Tolkapir says is Devam, Devam Unave. So he says God, food, and then the songs, the instruments they use, the nature of their labor. So God is very much a part of this. So Tolkapir enumerates the various presiding deities for the different landscapes. And more interestingly, that is still prevalent in Tamil Nadu. So in Tamil Nadu, if you, for example, Kurinji, all the mountainous, mountain and mountain related regions, the Kurinji, the presiding deity for Kurinji is Murugan. Uh, what Tolkapiam says, Seyon. Seyon Meya Maivarai Ulagh, he says. Maivarai is uh, the mountains, hill region, and uh, Seyon is the presiding deity for that. And even now we can see that. Even now, this particular concept that uh, uh, wherever you have a mountain or a hill, there will be a temple for Lord Muruga. Even in small, small villages, you can see that. So they, ha they have a mountain or a hill nearby their village. Then there will definitely at least be a small temple dedicated for Lord Muruga. And people, they often correlate mountains with Lord Muruga. Right? And uh, five out of the six uh, Arubadai Vid for Murugan, five out of them is situated, located in mountains or hilly region. So God is very much part of the uh, Agam theme, Puram classifications, both in Agam. So even though Agam is meant for love life, but there are scenarios, there are uh, scenes depicted where people, you know, they go and worship for a deity. For example, the daughter, so she is falling in love with the hero and uh, she is getting differences uh, physically and mentally. And uh, the parents, especially the mother, she will immediately assume that uh, she has been affected by some uh, spirit in the forest or the mountains. So she will arrange for worships, what we call very Adadal, uh, worships for uh, Lord Murugan. So they will, you know, in a very uh, in a very excited way, they will pray to pray to Lord Murugan and uh, they will request that Lord Murugan uh, quench the spirit in this girl's body like that. So that is part of the Agam literature. That's part of the Agam framework. Similarly, in the Puram framework, uh, it focuses on war, but when kings are going for war, there are a lot of ritualistic practices they have to follow. Tolkapir himself are listing all these practices. The kings will take a ritualistic bath. They will arrange for a ritualistic bath and a ritualistic worship for their weapons, for their drums, right? for their uh, mounts, horses, elephants. So there are a lot of things like that. And after the war, after the victory, then again there are ritualistic practices. So ritual, religion and gods are very much part of even the Agam Puram theme. So even though we say, uh, the Agam Puram themes are the primary focus of the Sangam literature, but the God and religion are uh, very much a very intricate part of them. And uh, these Sangam literature uh, comes under the heroic age poetry. So because they prize uh, individuals, so that's called the heroic uh, age poetry. And you know, there's a, there are certain traits the heroic age uh, poetries will uh, show. For example, they will exaggerate things. So ordinary men would have done something, but they, they would have exaggerated. If you remember, uh, if you have watched my video, the last video where we talk about the classical text, there we, I quoted, I gave an example of an Abayar song where she sings about uh, Adiyaman, the king, the chieftain king. Now Abayar prizes Adiyaman, you know, is, she says indirectly that Adiyaman is about uh, the valor, the prowess of Ariyam, Adiyaman is equal to about 2,500 ordinary soldiers. Okay? Or Adiyaman uh, can single-handedly battle 2,500 uh, soldiers of the enemy. Each and every warrior in Adiyaman's army is equal to 2,000 or more warriors of the enemy. Of course, that sounds very exaggerated, but that is the trait of heroic age poetry. So Sangam literature, they do that. But uh, even though they are heroic age poetry, one aspect of heroic age poetry is the parallelism that goes with uh, mythology. So if you look at uh, Greek literature or Roman literature, all these heroic age poetry, of course, Sanskrit is there in India, which is a very good parallel for Tamil. So if you look at all these literature, the exaggeration all, always comes with mythology also. So this uh, this exaggeration because they are they are having divine powers, they are being blessed by gods, or they are aspects of gods, what we call avataram. So these people are so powerful because they are avatarams of God. So those things are also there. That that, that goes hand in hand. And of course, as I mentioned, there are very specific. So in general, Sangam literature is non-liturgical. 
But there are very specific liturgical texts like Tirumurugatrupadai is full and full about Lord Murugan, all his different abodes and uh, how the deification of Murugan, all those descriptions, everything, uh, the different worships of Murugan, everything is listed. So it's a, it's a very, uh, very comprehensive text about Murugan and uh, Murugan worship for 2000 years before. And Paribadal, Paribadal uh, talks not only about Murugan, but also about Thirumal, Vishnu and the Madurai, Vaigai, all in a very religious as well as non-religious uh, aspect. So I have given both sides, right? Sangam literatures, they are basically non-liturgical text, but uh, they do talk about deities and religious philosophies. They primarily focus on Agam and Puram themes, but even though the themes themselves, the God, deification, deity, religion is very much part of rituals, are very much part of these landscapes. Tinai, the Tinai definition by uh, even Tultapir himself. And uh, they are heroic age poetry, they exaggerate things as well as recording the history but of course again that goes in hand in hand with uh, uh, divinity so there are very specific religious texts like Thirumur Ghatrupadai and Parivaral you can read them so then you can come to your own conclusion uh, regarding whether Sangam literature or secular or not as uh, as I said uh, you know the presiding gods of landscape so I will show that here so Tulkapir, uh, Tulkapiam's definition for the Fai, Tinai and uh, the presiding god for them so Kurinji, Mullai, Marudam, Neidal, Pali these are the Fai, Tinais and uh, Kurinji is mountain ranges and uh, related areas and uh, the presiding god for that is Seyon so Seyon is Murugan or uh, Subramanya uh, in the Sanskrit literature and again you know uh, people tend to say that they are different gods they are different entities because they have different names that is not acceptable so it's just if you look at only the level of the words of course, Murugan is a different word from Subramanya. But if you look at all the descriptions, right, especially for example, uh, both in Tamil literature as well as uh, in Sanskrit literature, Murugan is always identified with the number six. So the aspect of six is very is a repeated thing, a theme for Murugan, right? Like six phases and is uh, uh, Bishaksharam is uh, six letters like that. So if you compare that, then definitely Murugan is Subramanya. We can conclude, come to the conclusion. Maybe in a very uh, ancient time, there were two different ideas and concepts. But uh, when people started interacting, they coagulated together and became one deity. So that is the same thing for all the other uh, deities here. So Seyun and uh, people were hunters and mountaineers in the Kurinji landscape. Mullai is forest area, surrounding area. And uh, there the presiding deity is Mayon. We also saw this in Mullai Patil in the last video. Mayon is of course Thirumal. Thirumal is a Tamil word or Vishnu. So that is a presiding deity. He is also mentioned as the Parampurul. So cowards or shepherds, these are the people belonging to the Mullai region. And Marudam, where we have agrarian towns. So city, scape, township comes there. Uh, that's, a, that's a mark of evolution there. And uh, there the presiding god is Vendan. In Tamil we call them as Vendan. Vendan means king. And that is the direct uh, uh, cognate or uh, you know equivalent word translation of Vindra. So uh, we don't know which one is translated from which one. But both are same word. Vindra means uh, the head of a group or king in Sanskrit. Vendan means king in Tamil. So both the same deity. And uh, farmers, traders and statesmen were the people in the Marudam uh, landscape. And the uh, Neidal are seashores and related areas. There the god is Varunan. There is no translation available for this. So Varunan in Tamil as well as in Sanskrit. So from which one the other language borrowed, we don't know. We don't have enough sources to decide that. But Varunan is the same word. Same word is used both in Sanskrit as well as uh, Tamil here. So fishermen and seafarers uh, are the Nidal people. And finally Pali, which is uh, a wasteland, uh, a modification of Kurinji or Mulai due to lack of rains. So there the presiding deity is uh, Kotravai. This is not directly mentioned in Tolkapiyam, but uh, in other literature we can see that. So Kotravai is identified with Kali. So bandits, mercenaries were the people of these landscapes. So we can see uh, in the Tolkapiyam them itself, the landscapes, the Agam, Tira, uh, Agam Puram, Tinai definition, God is a very much uh, part of those uh, themes. And uh, Sangam literature talks about uh, religious philosophy, what we call Siddhantam. The Siddhantam in Tamil is uh, developed very uh, very well in a more refined manner in a, in a later period, around 14th century, uh, when we have started having a text from Saiva Siddhanta. But uh, in Sangam literature itself, we see the aspects of it, the seed for that philosophical ideas, concepts we see in the Sangam literature itself. And this is developed by the next period, what we call Bhakti era, which we'll be seeing in the upcoming videos. So there, the Alvars and Nayanmars, they developed these ideas, philosophies in a more detailed manner and uh, which got uh, uh, scripturalized later on. But the ideas are all the same. So they are all uh, prevalent among the Tamil people. So the basic idea is, you know, life. What is life? What is the purpose of life? So the existential question, that is what is answered by Siddhantam. So basically life, all life is what we call the Jeevatma or Pashu or Veer, right? In Tamil we call Veer or uh, in Sanskrit they call it as Jeevan or Jeevatma. Uh, that is Pashu, that is the life, that is us, all the objects. But these are all, there is a, another superior life form, superior form to that. That is what we call Iraivan or Kadavul in Tamil or Paramatma in Sanskrit. That is also called the Pati. So she, he or she, that entity is the head for all these lives. So that is Paramatma. These are all Jivatma. That is Iraivan or Kadavul. This is Uir. The Uir is bound by Kattu. 
right? We say kattu or patru in Tamil, which is maya, pasam. In Sanskrit, they call pasam, which is binding, right? So that binding is illusion, like uh, we have ego, agankaram, we say. And because of that, we do various deeds, karma. So we are supposed to experience the fruit of that karma. That is why we are having this life. So that is the existent existential question answered there. What is the purpose of life? So because of this binding, we are again and again becoming, you know, dying and uh, being born. So that life death cycle, samsara sagaram, pirappu irappu, you know, perun kadal, a big ocean of life and death. We are, we are uh, struggling in it again and again because of all our bondages. So if you lose the bondage, then the weir can attain the level of iraven or it can reunite with the God. So that is how uh, religious philosophy, religious views develop. Be it Vaishnavism, be it uh, Shaivam or be it uh, what we call Advaitam or Dvaitam or Vishishta Advaitam, they all agree in this particular premise. Uh, they only differ in the role. So whether Jivatma can become Paramatma or is it only joining with Paramatma? So that, that the nuanced topic, they differ, but uh, most other topics they uh, agree upon. So this is seen from Sangam literature itself. So Sangam literature itself, we can see all these concepts. So those are the, you know, secular or non-secular ideas in uh, Sangam literature. I will leave it to you to decide whether Sangam literature is secular or non-secular. That's up to you. You come to your own conclusion. We will move on to the next topic which is called distributive justice in Sangam literature, which in Tamil we call Pagirdal Aram. So basically, Tamil people have uh, hold on to a lot of values, ethics, ethos. One of the prime ethos for Tamil people is this distributive justice, what we call Pagirdal Aram. So they are stressing upon that. So the very purpose of a life, right? So in life, you can have different stages. You can have a learning stage. You are a child, you are learning. And uh, then you become a householder, Illaram, we call that. After that, you may choose to become an ascetic, Turavaram. Now, if you are a householder, you are in Illaram, then it is your duty to sustain others. So, it's not only for you, it should also sustain others around you. So, there, this Pagirdal Aram comes. In general, everything is for everyone. Right? So, sort of like a communism or socialism. But this is basically a very logical idea. right? So, this shows that Tamil people have uh, evolved from a very small group, from a small tribe, what we call Inakuru in Tamil. So basically, they, they were uh, very small groups and then they evolved into a, a city-state. So this we see in the landscape uh, definition itself. So we see the first landscapes, the Tinai were Kurinji and Mullai. So Kurinji is mountainous regions and people, small tribes living in the mountains. And the Mullai people coming down to the forest, again as a tribe. So as a tribe, they are very united, right? Everything in the tribe belongs to everyone. So the community, they live as a community, not as a family. And after that, then we invent uh, agriculture. Of course, across the world, civilizations invent agriculture. Then we transform into an agrarian uh, city-state. We set, start to settle down nearby the river banks. Then uh, we grow a bit more. Then currency comes in. So then people, they lose the sense of this, uh, you know, this close-knit family community thing. But even then, they hold on to certain values. So one of those key values they hold on to is this distributive justice, Pagirdal Aram. So people really thought, you know, you should do. So very uh, often we see poets, uh, Sangam poets up to even very later day poets, they all stress upon uh, being generous. Kodai, we call that. Kodai Alital. Kodai. Kodai means uh, donating things, gifting things to others. So they all stress upon that. So people, you know, when kings, they want to show that they are very good, their might. One of the things they can do is they can donate large uh, amounts of gold or, uh, you know, uh, things required for livelihood like uh, cattle, like uh, land, landscapes, people, uh, pieces of land. So they will donate that and they, they take a huge pride in that. So this this we see in, even in later day kings where they have donated huge, huge amounts to people and the temple, all those things. And uh, they have documented it. They have documented it in their uh, inscriptions. But of course, not for bragging. For documentation purposes, they have recorded in the inscriptions. But uh, the very nature that we should share. So sharing is the highest value. Sharing is the highest ethic. In fact, Thiruvalluvar says the very purpose of having wealth the, the maximum happiness you can get from your wealth is by sharing it. So when you share your wealth to someone, then uh, you get your maximum happiness. So if you use the, utilize the wealth for yourself, you buy something to eat or buy something to wear or buy some gadgets, of course you get happiness. But what is the maximum happiness you can get? That only by sharing. So when you share your wealth to others, that is when you get your maximum happiness, maximum uh, purpose of your wealth. And that is very deeply embedded in Tamil culture. Of course, in, it's a pan indic idea. But we see this represented in Tamil literature also in a very good way. So again, also, uh, you know, the, the right to resources is a basic right for every life form. Here, people, they are very brilliant, very nice that, you know, they are not only defining this for human beings. When we say it's a basic right, natural resources are a basic right for all human beings. They are not only restricting to human humans, they are, uh, they are expanding this idea to all life forms. So again, sharing with other lives is also very important. Right? So there are a lot of stories emphasizing uh, this idea. So, for example, the story of Sibi Chakravarti, when uh, 
uh, a dove comes to him asking for uh, recourse because it's been chased by a vulture. See, the king, he could have simply slain the vulture, but you know, he understands that, uh, he understands the ecosystem, he understands the balance in the ecosystem. He understands that as much as the dove has the right to live, the vulture also has the right for its food because the, in the nature system, the dove is the prey for the vulture. So he is not simply saying, I am the king, I am, I am not, I am blocking you from, I am prohibiting you from eating this dove or I am going to kill you and save the dove. He is not saying like that. He does a very nuanced thing. What he does, you know, he, he weighs the dove and uh, he is giving the, he agrees to give the vulture the equal amount of the dove's muscle from his own muscle. So he is ready to cut his own muscle and uh, provide that to a dove. Of course, this may sound like a very extreme measure, but you know, these are all used, these extreme examples are used to emphasize the point. So everything, everyone has the basic right. So that is where Aram comes in. What is Aram? So we said Pagridal Aram, distributive justice or virtue. What is Aram? In Tamil, the word Aram is a very, uh, you know, deep and uh, very broad uh, word. It, it encompasses a lot of meaning. And Aram is highly subjective. So you cannot uh, define Aram for every situation in a generic way. Of course, Tirukural, even if you read Tirukural, Tirukural starts with Arathu Pal. So the first segment of Tirukural is Arathu Pal. In Arathu Pal, Tiruvalluvar, Again, classifies Aram as uh, Illaram and Puravaram. So the householders and ascetics. So the, what are the Aram they should follow? But uh, if you see Tirukural, and the reason why Tirukural is considered very relevant even today is because Tiruvalluvar had taken only those concepts, those ideas which are generally applicable to a large sect. He is not uh, pinpointing situations and giving Aram because that will be huge. That will be, you know, uh, close and close up situations where nobody can pinpoint everything and uh, say, so this is the Aram for this situation because that people have to choose, decide by themselves. So Aram is basically very subjective. That is why we have all this literature, uh, we have all the kaviams, all these songs. So we should read all of them and come to our own conclusion. So in a given situation, what is Aram? What is right? What is wrong? That one, the person should come to the conclusion on his own. But of course, we can take guidance from all the literature, all the text available for us. Of course, if you are an Indian, if you are a Tamil, there is a lot of guiding text available for you in Tamil. And if you expand your boundaries, if you go to Sanskrit, again, you have a huge ocean of uh, guiding text. Based on them, you should come to our own conclusion. That is the important thing. But if you want to define Aram in a simple manner, then we can go to Parimel Adhar, the famous commentator of Tirukkural. So he, in his commentary, mentions what is Aram. Aram is Vidithana Seidalum Vilakkiyana Seyyamayum. So simply putting, so all our ancestors, you know, in all the experience dealing with the uh, things, right, of life, uh, statecraft, individual, society, so and all that, they have come to a lot of conclusion. So they have made a lot of rules, ethics, values. And these values, rules are always presented in two forms, affirmation and negation. So always do this, right? So tell the truth, satyam vada, why may pesu. Don't do this, inna seyyamai. If you look at Tirukural, if you look at the chapter readings of Tirukural, some of them will be affirmative. So do this. Have this. This is very important. Some of them, others will be in negation. Don't do this. Sayyamai, kollamai, kallunnamai. Don't do this. Don't do this. So, Aram is given in two modes. One in affirmation, another one is in negation. So, whatever is affirmated, whatever is affirmed, then you should do that. Follow that. So, whatever our ancestors have given that do this, right? So, be honest. Always speak the truth. Be sweet to others, right? So, that we should follow that. Viditana Saidal. So, whatever they have declared as correct, we should follow that. And uh, whatever they are prohibited is wrong, don't do that. Vilakkiyana seyyamai. So whatever is vilakkiyana prohibited, don't do that, right? Like uh, don't kill anyone, don't steal, don't be rude to people, right? Inna seyyamai, like that. So that is that is Aram. So Aram is following our ancestors because they have a huge background, they have a huge history. So Thiruvalluvar, for example, is not one man. So he's not in a, in a particular day, he decided, so I'll write some text, I'll write some couplets and uh, record that. No, it's not like that. So he is coming with a huge background. So what, whoever... All the great poets, all the great philosophers, all the great uh, wise men, right? Uh, both aesthetics and wise men in the courts of the kings who have dealt with everyday things and uh, come to conclusions of their own. So Tiruvalluvar took all, accumulated all that knowledge, representing all that knowledge as a sum total of all that knowledge. He put them in very concise, precise, beautiful couplets. That's what Tiruvalluvar did. Tiruvalluvar or Tulkapir, all our poets, nowhere they are claiming that this is my own knowledge like we do today. Even a small piece, we write, oh, this is mine, this is mine, I want copyright, everything like that. Of course, I'm not saying copyright is bad. Uh, we put the work, of course, we, we, have, we do have the copyright for that. But you know, the moral ownership, that is to someone else. That, that is to all the people before us. That is what people also done. So that when I say Viditana Sayyil, when I say ancestors, I mean those people, great people, wise people. And whatever they have decreed as good, we should follow that. And whatever they have prohibited as bad, we should not follow this. That is simply put as Aram. But of course, that's a very nuanced subject. So one has to read a lot 
and think a lot and come to their own conclusion. So what is Aram? What is good in a given situation? Depends on the situation. Depends on the stakeholders of the situation, right? So Viditana Saidalum and Vilakiana Sayyamayum. So performing the sanctioned and not performing or avoiding the prohibited. That is basic small definition of uh, a simple definition of Aram. So basically aim for the well-being of others and self. Uh, something like, you know, the loss of robotics by Asimo. So for a robot, it should not harm the humans controlling it or dealing with it. And also, you should not allow any harm to come for itself also. No point to withhold haram. You are not uh, required to damage yourself, allow harm to come to yourself. That is also very clear. So, for others, for also yourself. But, you know, put others before yourself. That is uh, that is haram. So, aim for the well-being of everyone. And that definitely comes by sharing. Sharing of resources, sharing of material, sharing of knowledge. Everything comes under that pagardal haram, distributive justice. We'll see two examples from our literature for this distributive justice where this is very much emphasized in a beautiful way. So one song is from Purna Nuru, the 182nd song of Purna Nuru, sung by Kadalul Mainda Ilam Peru Aldi. He is a Pandya king, right? So Kadalul Mainda means uh, finally he, he died by sinking in the sea. So it's called Kadalul Mainda. Kadal is, so Kadalul Mainda Ilam Peru Aldi. He is a Pandya king and he has sung this song, very nice song. I'm just giving the particular part here where he says sharing is important. He emphasizes sharing. He says, this is the start of the song. Undal amma evulaham. Indirar amuldam yeivadu ayinum inidu yana tamir undalum ilare. He says, people, see this world sustains. The earth is existing. This is not destroyed. The earth is existing because of the power of the aram, of the virtue of certain people, of those people. There are people. Undal amma ibulaham. The earth, ulaham is earth. So the earth is sustaining, it's existing because of certain people, people of certain quality, certain nature. What are those people? People who, even if they get the elixir of life, what we call amrdam or amrdam, right? The thing that when you eat it, you will not have a death or your death will be postponed to a very, very long time. So longevity, you will get longevity, youth, right? So if you, even people, if even if they get such a rare thing, right? So amrdam is very rare, you know, it's so almost an imaginary thing. It's only available for the gods, deities. So that is why he says Indira Amurdam. Indira refers to Indra and all the people related to Indra. So all the gods, deities. So this Amurdam is belonging to them. But you know, by some chance, a person gets his Amurdam. What will we What will we do? What will we do? Right. So if I get Amurdam, what will I do? I will quickly come to my home, close the door, lock the door and only call my close relatives and share the Amurdam with them. That's what I do. I'm a small lowly person. But what a great person will do? They will not eat it alone, right? That is what the uh, the king says. So they will not eat for themselves. If they get amurdam, they will share it with everyone. So they will look for the benefit of others. So why should I only be benefited from this? Let everyone be benefited. Or if there is only a small portion, so whichever uh, whoever will be beneficial to the human race. For example, if today Einstein were alive, so if I get amurdam, I will definitely give my amurdam portion to Einstein. Right? If Ramanujam, today is a birth century, century of uh, Ramanujam we are celebrating. So I definitely give my Amurdam portion to Ramanujam because if I live long, there is no use. But if Ramanujam or Einstein or other great people, they live long, definitely there is a great use. Even we have a example from Sangam literature itself. In Sangam literature, the King Adhyaman, which uh, whom we mentioned as uh, sung by Abhayar. So Adhyaman once uh, he goes on a very uh, risky hiking in a very risky mountainous terrain. And uh, there he finds a very rare uh, Nellikai, right? Amla. He finds a very rare uh, amla, nellikai, and uh, he realizes that this amla, if eaten, this will extend one's life and also give very good health for that life. And uh, he is not consuming that for him. So he brings it back. See, he risks his life and gets his amla, but he brought his brought that back and gave it to Abhayar. So he says, you know, Abhayar is a poet, a very scholarly person. If you live long, that will be more beneficial for the society. So you should consume this. And you know what? In that story, there's a nuanced thing. When Adhyaman brings that uh, Amla, Nellikai, and uh, gives to Abhayar, he is not describing the qualities of that. He is not saying, he is not revealing to Abhayar that this is a very rare Amla. He simply gives that as a, any ordinary Amla and says, eat this, taste this, see how it is. So Abhayar just like that eats that. And only after eating that, she realizes it's a different taste and uh, it's very unique. And then she asks Adhyaman and then she he explains, this will uh, you know uh, uh, lengthen your life and all those things. And Abhayar was very taken back. She didn't expect that. So that is the nature because you know he knows if he tells her that, uh, you know, this is an elixir or a very rare uh, amla and you eat that, then Abhayar definitely would not have taken that. So she would be arguing that you should take it, something like that. He didn't even give a chance for that. See, that is the nature of these people. They don't even consider taking the benefits for themselves. If they get a good benefit, they will definitely, without second thought, they will share it with others. That is the nature of these great people. And because of these great people, so because people like uh, such people exist, the world is sustaining because of these people. If uh, people like me 
are uh, populating this earth, the, the earth will collapse and definitely destroy in uh, within seconds, within nanoseconds. But there are great people who always think about others, always uh, benefit, uh, think about the benefit of the others. Because of those people, the world is sustained. That's what this king beautifully says. Undal Amma Ibulaham. Ulaham is world. So the world is existing. Undal, it's existing. Amma is a, a, a poetic word used to ex, uh, express uh, exaggeration or, you know, uh, is a wondering. So wonderment. Amma, wonderment. Undal Amma Ibulaham. Indira Amrudam. Even the elixir of the gods, even if they get the elixir of the gods, and in the later lines he says, So people who don't toil for themselves, not for their benefit, they toil for others' benefit. And we have seen so much, so many such people. And if you look at any mention in science or history, only such great people were being mentioned, right? Only because of their contribution, we have all these. We mentioned Newton, Einstein, great people, right? Because they, they didn't kept their knowledge for themselves. They shared. And that is because of that, the human race developed in its uh, capacity, right? And uh, we are all benefited. So because of such people, if people are all selfish, the human race wouldn't have come this long, right? Because of these people who share everything, even the rarest of rare things they get, they will definitely share with others without second thoughts. That's very important. They, they will not sit, consider the benefits. They will not do a cost-benefit analysis and then share. No, they won't do that. Immediately they will share. Their very nature is to share. So sharing, distributing is a very key element of wise people. Undal amma yuvulagam, indirar amuldam, yaivadu ayinum, inidu ena tamiyar undalam ilare. Like that. So they won't go inside and sit. Another, right? So the Tirukural captures this in a very many realms. For example, there is a Tirukural in hospitality. Virundombal, similar Tirukural to the pronoun of the song. Where Tirukalvar says, Virundu puratada taan undal, saava marundaninum vendar patrandu. Hospitality, Virundu Umbal Thiruvalluvar says this. So if you have a guest, Virundu, in your home, and uh, even if you have the Sava Marundu, Elixir, Amurdam, then you should share that. People will not take it for themselves. So you keep the guest in the hall and go to the kitchen and silently eat the Elixir. No, people will not do that. That should not be done. That's what Thiruvalluvar says, the same concept. But uh, this is another very nice couplet which talks about sharing distributive justice in Thirukural. Paguttu undu pal uyir ombudal, nulor tuguttha vattrul ellam thalai. So as I said, Thiruvalluvar is not an individual. So he is never claiming that uh, all these are my ideas, I invented them. No. He is saying that I am representing all the wise people, all the text, all the literature that has been put down before me. So he says like that, Paguttu undu pal uir ombudal, uir life, pal uir, the variety of life forms, right? the biodiversity, ombudal, to sustain them. How? Paguttu undu, sharing and eating. So whatever you got, whether it's small or large, share it with others. Here Thiruvalluvar is using the word uir. He is not saying humans. So he is not saying pal makkal ombudal. No, he says pal uir ombudal. So it's not only for human beings, it's for every life form. It's very magnanimous in his definition. So paguttu undu pal uir ombudal. Sharing with others and sustaining all others' life form as much as you can. You don't have to go and put, uh, provide food for everyone. But whatever is possible for you, do that. No door. All the wise people who have written books before Thirul Luver. Tukutta vattrul ellam talai. So whatever they have accumulated, whatever they have compiled in all the wise texts, all the literature about Aram. So Thiruvallavar here, he, he refers that he have read all those texts. So before him, there were so many texts. Like Thirukkural, there, there would have been so many texts before Thiruvallavar himself. So he here refers that I have read all of them. I have researched all of them. And uh, I see that in all of them, they unanimously agree that uh, this is the best among qualities. This is the chief among virtues. So what is the chief most Aram? That sharing your resources with everyone, every life, not only every person, every life. Paguttu undu palluir ombudal, nulor paguttu vattul ellam talai. Sharing one's food and resources with all life, thus sustaining them is the chief virtue among all that the wise people have compiled. So Thiruvallavar have clearly said that. So this is the distributive justice of the Tamil people. And there's another concept. So in Thiruvallavar, uh, he says that for, uh, again, householders, right? Illaram, Illaram people, people who are running a household. So they are the ones who get income. So how to share one's income? So Thiruvallavar gives this, you know, today, whether it's possible or not, but you can try this at least one tenth of this you can try. So Thiruvallavar says how you should share your income. So you should put your income into six parts. Each part should go to each of these people. Ten pulatar, deivam, virundu, vokkal, thaan. Enru, aangu, aimbulatthu, aru, ombal, talai. So Thiruvallavar says you share your wealth, all your income for uh, six divisions. See, Thiruvallavar here only mentions five divisions. The sixth division is implied, right? The sixth division is the duty of the king. That is the tax. So to collect the tax is the duty of the king. So here Thiruvallavar is talking about the duty of the householder. So paying tax is not the burden of the householder. Collecting tax is the burden of the king. So they, for a king, Thiruvallavar says how to collect tax properly. So here he is not mentioning that, but that is understood. So one's income should be divided into six portions. So one portion should go as tax to the king. That is why in all the ancient uh, literature in Tamil and Sanskrit, 
you can see that people mention the rightful tax for a uh, king is one sixth of the income of a householder, right? So king can get maximum of one sixth. That is maximum, like MRP. So that, that's not necessary. The king should get one sixth, but the maximum the king can get is one sixth because the other portions go to these people. So ten pulatar, ten pulatar is all the ancestors who are died, died, who we worship. Ten pulatar, deivam for God. You know, when you say God, when you donate to God or a temple, that goes to society, right? We will talk about that when the last topic, where in another unit we have a topic called uh, the role of temple and the uh, society. So there we'll talk how temple takes part in the societal uh, welfare, right? So when you donate to God, it's not simply to some deity, it should go to society, right? So Tenpulatar, Deivam, Virundu, Virundu is guest, but not like, uh, you know, my family, my extended family, not like that. Virundu, the word Virundu means new. So some some stranger comes to your, your home and you extend hospitality to them. That is called Virundu, that is called Virundu Ombal. Right? So uh, hosting strangers, right? And uh, helping them. So providing them a place to rest and uh, giving them food. That is called the Virundu Ombal. Vokkal. Vokkal means relations. One's own relations. Thorn. Self. So self means their family. So my my family, my spouse, my children, that family. So Fai. Thiruvalluvar mentions Fai here. So Tenpulatar, ancestors and uh, God, guest, relatives and self. Of course, tax comes. So king can take uh, one-sixth of the income of a householder. So one's income should be divided into six. Okay. So six portions. One-sixth of the income should go to each of these categories. So that is how we should uh, distribute our wealth and uh, live. Uh, whether it's possible to do that today, uh, that's up to you. You know, uh, for example, in today, even today, in Muslim community, they have something a concept called zakat. So what they do is uh, they keep certain amount uh, separately from their income as a zakat, and uh, during some religious ceremony, they will spend this for other people from their community who are not that much uh, wealthy. So they they help to they help them to financially improve. So that concept is there. That is very similar to this circle, right? So we should also be able to follow that. Even if you are not ready to give one sixth of your income, at least a small portion of that, right? The one sixtieth. Start with one sixtieth. That is not a big thing. So you can start with that. Small amounts will accumulate to large results, right? That is very important. That is the distributive nature of uh, uh, Aram, right? Distributive justice in Sangam literature. So these two topics we covered. The next topic uh, we we'll cover in the upcoming videos. So thank you for all your support, uh, likes, share, and uh, comments. And I'm looking for more comments. I'm taking all your feedbacks. So do keep them coming. Thank you very much. See you all in the next video.